Hello and welcome to another episode of Second Swing Thoughts. And today we have a very special one because um, the meat of the episode is going to be with a very, very special guest. Mark Brooks joins seven-time PGA Tour winner and 1996 PGA champion for our new series called Dinner with a Winner. And it's exactly what it sounds like. We sit down with Mark for some dinner. He chose Texas barbecue, of course, and we went through the line. He talked all about his favorite preferences when it comes to Texas barbecue. And then we sat down and, and further talked about his career in golf, favorite players to play with, and he shared a bunch of stories from tour as well. So stay tuned for that. Um, but we got to kick off today with Pierce Lanou back, um, our tour talk expert, if you will, and the writer of Sunday Swing, which is now up on secondswing.com. Uh, recapping the U.S. Open, kind of a big tournament, so we should probably yes. uh, cover that a little bit. So, Pierce, what a tournament that was! Um, lots of storylines, you know, in terms of the course and the, the country club, if you will, and then of course the leaderboard got absolutely loaded uh, into the weekend. So, uh, I mean, what are your key takeaways? What, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you, you know, maybe think about this event like five years from now? Like, what are you going to think of when you think of this tournament? Uh, well, I'll probably think of, um, well, first of all, let me say, I just ate lunch, <laughs> but man, I could go for some Texas barbecue yeah, right now. Yeah. That sounds fantastic. Yeah. Um, five years from now though, I think, you know, I mean, Wyndham Clark is, is a major champion yeah. and, um, maybe he has another man, one by then. It's just, I, I won't be shocked. Yeah. I mean, the guy, I think that second shot on, on the 14th hole on Sunday. Mm -hmm is yeah. probably what I'll, I'll remember. Um, and if not that, I think just the birdie on, on 18 on Saturday. Yeah. The epic club twirl. Mm -hmm. um, man, yeah, what a what a performance. Mm -hmm. I think we've all before, when we've been playing our recreational rounds, you know, hit one at the pin and we've got <laughs> done some sort of iteration of a club twirl. Yeah. And I think what he say, like, be right, very emphatically, yeah. he says, be right. <laughs> and it actually is, like, right by the hole. Yeah. Uh, that, there's something about that that is fun to watch and... You're right. I mean, that, that birdie and then the Fowler bogey that was kind of paired with it sort yeah. of turned things around. That I kind mean, of Fowler changed. was kind of in control most of Saturday up until really that moment. And then that kind of foreshadowed a little bit of what happened on, on Sunday where right from the get-go, Wyndham Clark and Ricky Fowler, who shared the lead going into Sunday, they kind of went opposite directions. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that club tour on Saturday kind of – like you said, yeah, it completely changed the, the landscape of the, the tournament. You know, coming into 18, I think I was even thinking, like, okay, like, Ricky's got a good chance to have a one- or two-shot lead here going into Sunday. And then, you know, that, that unfortunate mm -hmm. short miss and, yeah, Wyndham with that that sweet birdie. If there was ever a time for a club twirl, oh, yeah. that was that was it for sure. So, uh, yeah, that was just super impressive. Um I think another thing that I, I want to touch on, I think the 14th hole on Sunday is really what decided the tournament. Yeah. And man, another opportunity for, for Rory that, that slipped away. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to ask your thoughts too on that relief you got. Um, yeah, I didn't expect, when I mean, you first saw where the ball was yeah. and you know where it was placed and stuff. I mean, actually, the last thing that came to my mind was that free relief was going to yeah. be the result. Um, but it, it, in a way, it feels right that he came up a shot short because of you know it, it kind of just feels <laughs> right. I mean, again, I'm I'm not the rules like guru here, um, but it it just didn't feel that he should have. And then yeah, especially with what happened at the PGA in both instances of a player you know losing a stroke there and stuff like it just it was. Again, I'm no, I don't know exactly the interpretation of the rules is there to like get the, the relief. Right. I know they explained it a little bit on the broadcast, but I, I don't know. It just didn't feel quite. Sorry. Quite so right. what what I'm hearing is the golf gods do exist. I, yes, that's more <laughs> or less. Yeah, yeah. So that yeah. was that's kind of my takeaway of it. Yeah, I just man, it's like all we had to do there literally was make par. Yep. And he's in a playoff, mm -hmm. and that's a hole where. You know, he was driving the ball longer than anyone all week. And, that, yeah, I mean, he can easily reach that green in two. He just kind of, I think he pulled his drive into the rough, had to lay up. I mean, obviously, the U.S. Open rough is not not going to be not gonna be too good. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and then, you know, the wedge in the hand, that that was arguably a worse mistake than the tee shot. Oh, yeah. I think he, what was he, 100, 
115 yards, something like that. He mentioned that, you know, talking to, I think he was on NBC afterwards, yeah. um, as they were preparing to have, you know, the, uh, you know, the celebration and the awarding to Wyndham Clark, they, they talked to Rory and he said that was that wedge shot is what he'll kind of rue his is the word yeah. he's used. Um, yeah. And that has been an issue for him. You know, he's all these other parts of his game are in really good shape. It's just those kind of, there's a few wedge shots around where he just will, you know, greatly miss his, yeah. his target. And those are opportunities for birdies that, yeah. you know, in the prime of his career there, when he was winning in the early 2010s, he was winning majors. He was throwing darts with, you know, regularity on those mm-hmm. shots. And lately, it's been like a few of those around where he, it's a really good opportunity for a birdie, and he just doesn't quite, yeah, um, hit him right. Yeah, and then I mean, even he gets the free relief, and it's like, okay, here's like, here's another here's chance break, for yep. you. Like, couldn't get up and down. So, um, yeah, and then obviously Wyndham came in there and handled business, mm-hmm. made a made an easy birdie, and. Um, yeah, that just about just about sealed it but right it, they got a little bit shaky yeah there. Wyndham I think he then bogeyed the two holes after that mm-hmm. and then that made it only a one shot lead um but to par 17 and 18 yeah especially with that up and down 17 yeah the way he did um you know you, you deserve it at that point you right because you're, you're most times the U.S. Open winner doesn't just get to you know skate in and and um you know, have wiggle room, if you will, right. down the stretch. And he didn't, and um, especially in those last two holes, and he was able to make the pars that he had to, a two-putt from 60 feet or whatever it was. Yeah. Uh, that's no joke. No. And the way he did it, too, I mean, perfect speed. I think a foot left of the hole or whatever was his yep. putt. So um, that's uh, that's impressive. And now, so he, speaking of a guy who's risen to the top. Yeah. You know, he is, if you, I remember looking at leaderboards you know you'd, you'd look on thursday at like 10 a.m and he'd be five over already you know mm-hmm. um and basically this year everything's flipped around he, his iron game is in miles better um, he's always been a good driver and kind of putter of the ball but everything in between was sort of inconsistent and now you're seeing that come to form here now he's really a i mean an all-around player that He's going to be on the Ryder Cup team most likely now. You would think, yeah. Um, I mean, he's, he's he's a force we reckon with. He's now world number 13. Yeah. Like, and I think, I mean, he was outside for sure the top 100. I think, I'm pretty sure I saw a stat. Run. It was like end of 2022 season, he was like 160 yeah. something in the world. Yeah, because and he, even leading up to the Wells Fargo, he was placing highly in PJ Tour events regularly. You know, he wasn't yeah. his, you know, old Wyndham Clark was missing cuts with ease, right? Um consistently and then he'd have the occasional week where he'd contend but it wasn't consistent this week is or this year excuse me has been extremely consistent for him so hats off to Wyndham Clark for um I mean the, the rise in the 2023 that he's had has been yeah incredible yeah well he's I mean I, I was just looking at like his stats and like there isn't really a hole right. in his game I think he's he's like fifth on tour in driving distance which like yeah which you, you, when you, you think of bombers, I'm sure you don't think Wyndham Clark, but that dude yeah. pounds the ball. And even if you did think of it, you, you know, he hadn't before this year. He hadn't really right. won anything with it, yeah. so you kind of dismissed his name a little bit. Yeah, but, yeah. So um, I mean, he's like top five in driving distance. He's, I also saw he's like first on tour and putting inside three feet, which like yeah. sounds kind of, I don't, yeah. not dumb, but it's like, oh, you know, three footers. Well, that's probably if you think about it, you know, I. A shot or two, maybe a yeah. tournament. The margins you know, where, out there are so yeah. thin. I mean, I could probably count at least two or three of those that Rory and Scotty both missed this week. Yeah. You know, and Wyndham just, you know, for whatever reason, he doesn't miss those short putts. Mm-hmm. I know Finau missed like an 18 inch oh, yeah. putt on, well, I think it was Friday. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it happens. Like, yeah. like th- these guys miss putts inside three feet. Yeah, it's and you not typically common, do, it's, but, you don't see it on TV because most of the time those guys aren't contending yeah. hard in the event um, with a chance to win. So that happens and well, help happens to everybody except for Wyndham Clark. So, yeah. yeah um, super cool story too, by the way. Yes. Yeah. So should we talk about Ricky a little bit? Yeah. Because there's another guy who's the last year really has pre- had a pretty meteoric rise back to the top. Now that's a guy he, he was sort of near the top before. Uh, and I believe one year was it 2017 or 2018, whatever. Uh, one of those years, he led the tour in strokes gain total. Mm-hmm. Um, then he, of course, the last couple of years struggled mightily with his game. Really, everything was was lost. And 
Um, he's found a way to get it back and to fire the course or the U.S. Open record Thursday, and for really 54 holes, 53 holes, had complete control of everything and looked like he was going to win a major. Yeah, I mean, if you think about Ricky Fowler and kind of the the trajectory of his career, like you said, I mean, early in his career, he was near the top of mm-hmm. the game. I think, I think probably fifth in the world sounds right as yeah he was definitely in the top 10 and I mean world he ranked. didn't have he didn't amass the number of wins you maybe would expect right. from somebody that high in the world yep but it was a top 20 top 10 machine which it sounds kind of like Victor Hovland right now mm-hmm. um, is how I would compare that but yeah you know he he would be top 10 top five in like every major and then all of a sudden yeah 2019 2018 just hit rock bottom his game yep. completely fell apart i think he fell all the way to like almost 200th in the world ranking something like that he's now he's now climbed back inside i think the top 40. yeah um yeah i mean <laughs> with another another you know he's all, another uh player that will have some Ryder cup considerations he's, yeah he's been playing great all year i think like starting at the end of last season he really started to string together some good events and and um yeah, I think the big thing for him is the is the the driving. He's been mm-hmm. driving it really well, and he's been putting it really well. Yeah, which, which another thing, putter. the putter. Both of them use the same. Well, thing. Well, Wyndham Clark told Odyssey to build him Ricky's putter. Yeah, and they were like, okay, so like because they had played together, and, yeah. and Wyndham said, well, Ricky was making every putt with the thing, so I tried mm-hmm. it out, and I was like, okay, I want to try this. And I uh, I actually so when Wyndham won this or won in, in uh, Wells Fargo. Yeah. I remember because we did, you know, watching the bag stuff and, 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 you know, content like that. And we definitely had a, an amount of jailbird verses in our inventory. We no longer um, do. We no longer do. And I imagine that may have happened over the weekend where mm-hmm. all those were uh, sold out. Now, granted, they had the longer shaft and the, the super stroke uh, grip. So there's probably some customizations there that are being had for people that are trying to copy this yeah. up. But there's something about it that works clearly. Yeah. And I believe funny. on both of them, they also have like completely covered yeah, soles lead tape. of lead tape it's like 20 grams of lead tape yeah. or something yeah um yeah it seems so so funny like and it's funny that that was the final pairing on yeah. on both days yeah, on the weekend the last two days um the jailbird bros yeah something yeah. To, something about it i mean mm-hmm. we, i think wyndham's kind of talked about it where he just feels like on short putts like he just can't miss like it's so just like steady Which, sturdy face balanced and yeah, anytime you can find something where you're standing over a six footer and you're not worried about missing your line, that's I mean, that's, that's the huge. ultimate. That was I. The only reason I would ever have that was back in the day when belly putters were allowed. I actually mm-hmm. played one, and that's what it felt like. I mean, you, yeah. you were like, I, the only reason I missed this putt is because I misread it. Yeah, and he's clearly got a setup there. He and Ricky both do where they know they know they're gonna make the putt if they read it right. Yeah, which is. I'm sure confidence-wise, it's got to be super mm-hmm. helpful for both of them. Yeah, so. we'll see if um, maybe like Scotty Scheffler could could benefit from right. from a jailbird. <laughs> yeah, we should actually. So he didn't putt as badly no. this week. Yeah, he wasn't like a bringing his whole game down like the last few yeah. weeks before that. I think but. he actually was on the positive side of the the strokes gain stat, yeah. just barely. But yeah, just another another ho hum week for right. Scotty Scheffler. It does feel like his floor right now is like, you know, fifteenth in the major. Yeah, like, like that's w- worst like if he plays scenario. poorly, he'll still make the cut and yeah. you know, sneak into the top twenty. Yeah, somehow. which like Saturday, I think he kind of was struggling and you know, it seemed like he was out of it. I think he was at like four under and then all of a sudden seventeenth hole holes out for Eagle. Just, yep, just cans one from two hundred. And then Birdie's eighteen and it's just like okay, like this is just ridiculous. Yeah. Seven under, three back going into the Sunday. I I thought he was going to be the one to, to come back and win. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously that, that didn't happen. But, yeah, it's like every time he tees it up, we keep talking about it. It's, it's a broken record at this point. It's like yeah. Scotty Scheffler, top five, right there. Yeah. Sunday at a major. <laughs> right. It is uh, it is pretty crazy to, to see how consistent he has become. Mm-hmm. And it's consistently great. And one of these weeks when everything kind of works, I mean, he's going to – just cut the players, you know, he's going to win by six, six shots again. Yeah. Um, and that won't surprise anybody when that happens. So, um, 
give me so we'll kind of wrap up here with maybe one sort of disappointment that you have from the week though it could be a player could be anything related to the event um one disappointment that you have from the u.s open this year um well i think i, I want to know what's going on with uh justin thomas yeah i think he shot this week like 73 81 yeah something like that was, you know he broke he, well, he didn't break 80 on and on um you know, I'm not like a huge JT guy, but you know, when JT's playing well, it's you know, it's, the game's better. It's it's fun when JT's in contention. You know, he's fun to watch. Mm -hmm. um, one of those kind of prolific iron players in the game, and um, yeah, to see him shoot those scores is just just odd. And I know he hasn't been playing great this year, but he's kind of popped popped up on leaderboards here and there, and um, yeah, I just didn't expect didn't expect to see those scores from him. So yeah. Um, it was that one and Max Homa too. I know mm -hmm. they actually got together on Sunday. Yeah, they were around. they were goofing around yesterday on Twitter. It was pretty funny. Um, so maybe that was uh, a blessing in disguise. Right. But but yeah. uh, the I mean Homa was one where he actually had a solid first round. He was two under and yeah. then yep. he really struggled on that. And I'm yeah. I'm waiting for him. I mean it's he's I think he's even said it like his game's too good to not be, you know contending with in these majors yeah and something he's something been about really struggling in them every yeah. every time i don't know his best finishes i think this augusta this this spring was really his best finish yeah i think like t20 something yeah. sounds about right for um, his best major finish so, yeah and, and he's, he's you know he's been in the top 10 of the world rankings i mean he's 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 eventually got to show that uh, otherwise this label as this guy who's scared of the bright lights um of a major which I mean, they're gonna be validated so. right which shouldn't make sense because he's won you know he's won big tournaments he's won a he's won a designated event oh yeah he's won riviera it's not like he can't he can't beat that field right it's just the, the whatever it is about major whatever it is about mm -hmm. major championships yeah he just hasn't he hasn't pieced it together yet so i think yeah i think that'll be something to watch kind of mm -hmm. going forward maybe maybe he'll he'll show up at the open and, yeah. and surprise us um but yeah then i mean leading into next year Maybe he's just got a, I don't know, change his mentality, something like yeah, that. Yeah, there's there's something going on there, and because we all we know he has the game, uh, right? But yeah, definitely not the week that I think either of them envisioned mm -hmm. for themselves. So and yeah, I think one other thing that I found kind of odd was the uh, like the crowd size. Yeah. Um, it was just like yeah, like Saturday at, at the U.S. Open, and Ricky Fowler makes a 60, 70 foot putt from. Green you could side hear on, anything. A, on a par three, and it's like crickets. Well, the, like, the fascinating it? thing to me was that it seemed like on right, you know how like you, you watch a PJ Tour event, you watch really any major, there's around the tee box, there's ropes and people, mm -hmm. you know, rows of people behind, especially on the weekend when it's guys in contention, like oh there's a gosh. huge crowd following them. And I don't even remember a, a tee box out there where there was a crowd near the tee no, box. No, yeah, it's like this is, I mean, this is Ricky Fowler. Yeah. Come back story perhaps of, the most popular player in terms of you know positive perception yeah i mean arguably out there yeah one of the most definitely not even it's not even a question he's one of the most popular players in the game mm -hmm. and seemed like the whole golf universe was pulling for ricky fowler and then you watch the coverage and it's like there's 200 people it yeah. seemed like so yeah. i just thought I, that was I don't you know, know if because uh, they are supposed to. They're scheduled to host another one in twenty like thirty nine. Yeah, um, it's a long time. So down the road. and I know yeah that's sixteen years from now. So you know a lot can change. But I'm hoping by then, whether it's LACC or the USGA or what have you, they sort of um, repurpose some of their setup where fans can get closer. You know the walk around the course is maybe a little easier, or there's you know fewer roped off areas. Mm -hmm. I mean something where that environment can be a little bit more you know U.S. Open like. Yeah. Yeah, I just thought that was, you know, maybe one thing that I thought was a little disappointing. But other than that, I mean, I thought the course was cool. Yeah, it was. Fairways are wider than usual, but I right. think it created like a, you know, I think it created a setup where the, your good play was rewarded the right way. Yeah. And bad play was rewarded, you know, the the right way too. Yeah. I mean, and there was the bad scores were because you weren't hitting the ball well. Yep, and I saw a lot of complaints on Twitter after, you know, how golf Twitter is. Yeah, after, yeah. Oh, yeah. you know, the round one with Xander and Ricky shooting 62, 
a lot of complaints about you know it's too easy it's too easy the course should never be playing yeah. which you like knew that you knew the course would toughen up after but that. then like yeah the winning score was 10 under so yeah. it's like okay yeah these guys shot eight under in the first round but they both finished worse than that for mm-hmm. the tournament so it kind of tells you right there like okay the course was yeah. was difficult enough right i mean in the course will always be a talking point on us open yeah. just because of the usga's history with setups and some yeah. some uh you know controversy perhaps on some of their setup yeah. choices in the past <clears throat> few years but um yeah, yeah well as viewers i mean we're picky and everyone has has their preferences right. so yeah well we get back to regular pga tour you know scheduling this week the travelers elevated event. elevated this week so that'll yeah be fun. so it'll be and another then, good uh, field we also have another major yet in about a month yep. at the Open. So um, we got a lot of good golf coming up right in the middle of the summer. And then I know the big one for us, too, right after the Open is going to be the 3M Open here in yes. Minnesota, which will be exciting, too. So, Sweet. Um, Pierce, thanks for hopping on to discuss the U.S. Open. Obviously a thrilling event for, for television. That's kind of all we're really looking for. So. Yeah. Yep. All aboard the, the Wyndham Clark train. Yes. Yes. And maybe he wins another one here in a yep. month. But... Um, otherwise, listeners, viewers, stay tuned here. We've got uh, our interview with Mark Brooks coming on right now. So uh, thanks again, Pierce. We'll have you on next yep. time. Always a pleasure. All right. Well, Mark, I'm I'm very full. Uh, that well, was good. That was fantastic. Uh, I I didn't really know what I was going to what was going to happen when you had the bread and then you started wrapping it up and everything. But I got to say, you, you know your way around a barbecue place. So. Well, this is a good one. <laughs> There's a lot of good barbecue in this state. Yeah. And they, they, these guys do it right. Mm-hmm. So that was your little fold over. Uh, yeah. Fold over. And I don't know about a wrap. But you didn't fold yeah. wrap well, it. Well, it, it was, yeah, I, I've never actually had a slice of bread and folded it with any type of anything in there. So that really? Was, that was good. That was, okay. that was the great, great way to start doing that. Uh, that is my plan from now on when I whenever I have to come back down here for the store for second swing whatever it might be I'll stop by and I'll do that so that's um, awesome so kind of segueing into your career a little bit um, talk we got to talk about a champions dinner because that's sure. kind of what this whole dinner with a winner thing is sort of I got it about is getting a winner in here having them pick a meal and and it's similar to champions dinner and you had one as a PGA champion so we alluded to it kind of um, off air um, that you had you were up at winged foot so not quite texas barbecue up there well no there's but there's more but, so bobby nichols yeah. is kind of credit is basically credited with starting the past okay. champions dinner in the 60s got a mid mid 60s and it kind of caught on and it was going pretty full steam by by the time i was fortunate enough to win the pga obviously you host the following year yeah. And unlike one tournament, we move. Our tournament, yeah, the right. PGA moves every year. And that year was at Wingfoot, mm-hmm. and I wanted barbecue. I definitely <laughs> wanted to bring in the Texas barbecue, Angelo's in Fort Worth, which is a long standing, you know, traditional barbecue joint. It used to have sawdust on the floor. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, the best cold, you know, schooners of beer and juice you could ever imagine. Anyway, we figured out it was going to be too tough to get it up there. Yeah. And they're, they weren't going to rebuild their barbecue pit in uh, Mamaroneck, New York. So <laughs> I defaulted and I went with a traditional steakhouse. Mm-hmm. And we I did large, pound and a half, bone-in, prime ribeyes. And then all the trimmings of a traditional steakhouse. Yeah. And I, I still get compliments on, on choosing a pretty straightforward dinner. People yeah. like, I, I think I had to have a fish entree as, as a backup. But I wanted to be barbecue, but we couldn't get it up there. Oh, sure, sure. Well, uh, it's, it's fun to go back, and that's always kind of like a question that I ask people when they jump on for, you know, it might be members of the Second Swing team or other guests that we have on the podcast anyway, is I always ask, what would your champion's dinner be if you, you know, won you know, a major Augusta or PGA, whatever it might be, but now I actually get to ask somebody who did win. And as game. you get older, after you've done it, you would, you know, like in my case, it would be a no-brainer. It would either be barbecue or Tex-Mex. So yeah. That's what it. That's what it would be. So that's what we had today. We had some Texas barbecue. So um, that's correct. So talk about that PGA. We'll go right there to start. So um, I think you know we're at Valhalla and we did some club testing this morning actually, which um, tune into those videos as well. But we looked at some of the clubs you hit. So I think what I guess 
Here's the question. Going into that week, did you feel good about your game? or like, I what did. Is, I, was, so, I was having a good year. Okay. So I'll back up to the session today with uh, the little railer. Yeah. You know, call it strong forward that I used. I have not seen, I haven't really pulled that club out and looked at it for yeah. tw- 25 years, 20 plus years. And the first take this morning when I set it down there, of course, I, I don't play much golf anymore, but I set it down behind it. I said, this is going to be tough. <laughs> I know. I mean, it, looked, it, looked hard. It, too. it looked hard to hit, and it proved to be hard to hit. Yeah. But that year in 96, I actually won. I, I started playing better golf in, like, 1988. Okay. I mean, I made some big swing changes after the mm-hmm. 1987 season. Finally figured out I couldn't do it on my own. Got some help and got video. And yeah. so I was able to see what I was sure. needing to change and turn what used to be would purely feels, I got to turn it into something that felt real and was yeah. real. So that was the big change. And then I had a couple of, some really nice years, like 91, 92, I had a bunch of top 10s, a lot of, you know, a lot of contention, uh, won a couple times uh, through there. And 96, I actually, I, I won the Bob Hope, which would have been in January, late, mm-hmm. you know, let's call it late January. I won the Houston Open, which would have been in April or May. Okay. And I was probably second or third, maybe top three on the money list. So, yeah. I mean, they probably didn't count me as a favorite, but I certainly would have been one of the top, say, 15 yeah. or 20 players. Okay. So it wasn't a shock to be in contention. Yeah. Because I'd already, you know, does that make sense? You know, no, well, yeah, totally. Well, this came out of the blue. And I had those experiences, and they're more frightening. <laughs> because you kind of feel like you smoke and mirrored your way, or you putted yeah. your way into that last group, and now but, will, it, will it hold up? Probably not. But looking at your past results, you... I mean, nobody should have been that surprised that was following golf, the way you were playing up to that, a couple wins. I would agree. You had been in contention, and, and your name was up on the top of the leaderboards often. <laughs> the other thing I'd add, you know, it's, again, because we get to have time to go a little deeper, but it, I, I really, my game didn't look like on paper it would fit a Jack Nicklaus style golf course, you know, which should have been high fades into the greens. But I had some unusual success at Muirfield in Ohio, okay. in Columbus, oh, Ohio. Sure. Yep. Which is, you know, one of his, it's, you know, his baby, and what I I think what happened, I was a pretty decent iron player, pretty good distance control, even though I didn't have a high trajectory. So I had some pretty good success of getting the ball into the right sections of the greens mm-hmm. at Muirfield, and I, mean, I didn't win. I didn't really come that close to winning there, but you know, I had generally no trouble making the cut and yeah. having a good good tournament there. So Valhalla was a Jack Nicklaus yeah. golf course, and Bill. Not too long after that same time frame. So there were a lot of similarities in the shot values that were asked. Right, okay. And so I like that going in. And probably to my benefit, playing in August, you're going to have softer bent grass greens. So I wasn't playing rock hard greens. And I mean, you can even see it from the tape. Balls coming in there. Get, it's getting soft, the blow softening a little bit just because they had to keep them a little bit mm-hmm. moist. We did have rain one day. So a lot of factors kind of kind of bled in there to make it probably luckily a good week for me. And I yeah. hung in there and, and to be honest, uh, I've seen their tape, re- you know, of course you've seen the, you know, the yeah, replay you, a few times. It. There literally were five or six guys with a few holes to play that had a good shot at winning. And to my benefit, their demise, several of them actually boogered the, butchered the 18th hole. Yeah. And I ended up making four to get into the playoff. Mm-hmm. But when you, you see it back, you go, "Whoa, boy, you you were pretty fortunate." Yeah, you're probably you're probably looking the the last couple holes of that, and you're if you're watching it for the first time, you're like, "This, you know, Brooks is probably out of this thing. He doesn't have a chance." And then as as guys, well, maybe it was VJ Singh up. and not just Kenny Perry. There were several players at, in '96 at Valhalla that had a shot with yeah. a few holes. I to saw play. Phil was a leader at one point too. I'm sure. Um, so yeah. now mentally, are you? Well, I guess down the stretch of a major, do they have? Is there leaderboards out there? I imagine. And Damn like, right. Are you are you looking at them all the time, or are you? Yeah, not okay. all the time, but like how closely? If, if was, you were yeah. playing it, again, this is that smoke and mirrors thing. If you didn't feel really good about your game, you might try to duck the boards. Mm-hmm. You might try to not to see. If you're playing good, it, it it didn't bother. You shouldn't bother you to see where you yeah where where what's happening. Right. I suppose you know, if you have the ultimate confidence on. in your game, you're and not then, worried about where that is. You just I don't know, know about ultimate confidence. It's just a matter: are you going to let you know that piece of information affect how you yeah, perform? I and suppose. the more fragile you are, the less you know. The more blinders you want to put on. I mean, I've always it, 
my dealing with boards goes way, way back, and I won't even get into some of the stories. These are guys that even had content, had, were in contention at the British Open. Okay. Back in the, actually, this would have been mid '60s, and they were talking. You know, he had this horrible experience. I go, and he t- explained it, and he actually lost two British Opens by a shot. At the British Open, then they didn't really have leaderboards, only up by the clubhouse. Mm-hmm. Okay, and they had a walking standard yep, bearer yep. that had the twosomes. Yep, had the right, score had just in the group. And the way you knew if you were leading coming down the stretch were if the bobbies with the hats on started following your group. And he said on about 16 green, the bobbies showed up. So he's so he was thinking. And he's and looking out, around. Well, no, he looks. He goes. He's this. He's telling the story. It's an awesome story. And he's he he looks up and he goes. Well, I'm beating the guy I'm playing with, so that's a problem. <laughs> he was like three ahead of the guy yeah, he yeah. was paired with. He goes, that's a problem. And he proceeded to hit two of the worst seven irons on the next two holes that oh, he no. said he had ever hit in his life. So he was trying to tell us never look at the boards again. Okay, so it was really funny but, and a wonderful man. And uh, I played golf with his son at, at, at Texas, Paul Thomas. This was Dave Thomas who turned okay. into a fa- famous golf course architect. But he told that story. Yeah. And this is also the guy that also gave a hole in a Ryder Cup because he had the chip yips. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. You've heard I this do, story. I remember that. He, you yep, know, yep, Mr. Yep. Green, he had to, was going to have to pitch over the bunker and... He looked at it for about five minutes, and he finally decided he ended up giving the guy the hole. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually do remember hearing about that story. That's... And he did it because he knew he was going to, like, chili dip it or double hit it yeah, or whatever. It was gonna, to, and it was going to destroy him for the rest of the round. So the like, one hole's forward. worth it. So he picked. <laughs> But anyway, so back to the leaderboards. I determined it was worth seeing. I mean, you'd look. Yeah. I mean, you know, especially situational. Right. I mean, you know, how would you feel if last hole and you – you got wrong information, for example, or you didn't look, and you you could easily reach a green right. and two. You could have played the shot differently. Yeah, and then you laid up, hit it in there conservatively, and you end up losing by one. You go, you could hit a forward on the green, and right. two putted, and maybe won the golf tournament. So yes, you, I like, I think you should know. So and then right after your playoff, they actually switched the three hole format, right? Oh, and by the way, let's go back to that. You don't need to worry about it on Thursday or Friday, really. Okay, <laughs> unless you're trying to make the cut. And I'm just saying the leaderboard thing, things change. Right. When you're going 72 holes, that's the other part when people talk about last round or the other thing I, I always broke it down. It's like you're lead, leading or in contention. Oh, you still have 25% of the tournament left. You know what I mean? That would be like, well, the, the round's going to end after 13 holes. No, right. no, no. Same thing with the 72 hole golf tournament. Even though some guy's leading through three rounds, he's still got 25% of the tournament to play. So it, it looks more intense than it is at the end, but. You know, that the, the old saying, the, guy, the two-footer he missed on Thursday is just as important on Sunday. Unfortunately, that's kind of true. Yeah, I suppose. It is. It, it is true. Because it does. It can change so rapidly in a, no doubt. But a I, few holes. Not to run off, but that was, I was already having a good year, so I wasn't shocked, and things worked out. Yeah. Thank, thank God. Yeah. I mean, that's – I mean, winning a, a major tournament like that is certainly – a tremendous, tremendous accomplishment to, to reach really the, the pinnacle of golf there. So I don't know about that. <laughs> well, I mean, it, hey, I mean, a major win is a major win. That's the, the, a, that's yeah, a, there's a certain a, upper echelon of, of course, golfers. The older I've gotten, the more you end up, you know, getting interviewed or talking about it. And yeah. certainly, the last few years with all that's gone on, you know, and I've done some television work. You, you end up talking about, it, you know, how what's the difference? Why is it important? Yeah. And, and it's just it has a historical permanence to it. Yeah, oh, totally. And, you know, half the tournaments are more that I won, but well, not many, but let's, whatever, the seven, they're gone. I mean, they don't even exist anymore. Does that make, oh, you yeah. know, they're, they're just, they're total, total. Like, there's different sponsors, new I courses. Mean, we don't even have certain name and names, names yeah. but if you went through the last, you know, 30 years, there's a lot of golf tournaments that don't exist that lasted, some maybe four years, but some lasted 15, yeah. 18, 12, 10 years, and they're gone. And that's okay, and that's fine, but that's not the case with the majors. Right, exactly. All right, it's not the case, and... And that's actually fun next year because the PGA goes back to Valhalla next year. It so, does. And, so uh, I'm sure you'll probably be featured in some of the... I will not be featured. You'll featured it's, in some it, of the... the it's just the, the memories. They'll show highlights and stuff like it's that. It's the trivia but. question. You can win a lot of money because no one will get it right. You <laughs> said, well, they've had they've had four major events at Valhalla. They had a Ryder Cup in 2008. Yeah. We won. Yes. Tiger Wood, uh, Roy McIlroy won in 2014. Yep. Tiger Woods famously won in 2000. He beat Bob May in the playoff. And he goes, and there's another one. So you go Tiger Woods, Roy, Roy McIlroy, Ryder Cup, and then they'll, they'll never get me. But it's kind of fun. 
So I can, <laughs> I awesome. stump my friends all the time. Yeah, there's been three guys with there. Tiger, Rory, and <laughs> who's the last guy? They, they can't get it. <laughs> That's awesome. But anyway, it's fun. Um, so the I think the other piece of your career that um, I wanted to mention was the U.S. Open, um, the the playoff there. Completely different playoff format, by the way. So um, what was that experience like? Um, I mean, obviously you're probably very disappointed that it didn't end up in a win, but to have a chance at a second major, you know, a few years later. Pretty pretty different, even only five years later, but pretty different stage. Yeah. Uh, in my life or golf career, I, you know, like a lot of guys, started having a little bit of back trouble, mm -hmm. and you know, thank, thanks to the reverse C, <laughs> growing up, you know, dr mm -hmm. let's call it 60s, 70s golf swing style, uh, I finally developed some, some back issues, you know, the old herniated disc. I got pretty fortunate. I never had leg leg pains, but it, it was uh, something I had fought. And that was in 2000. At the end of the 2000 season, that's when it hit me. And so I spent months and months and months and, you know, dealing with that and to varying degrees of success, finally kind of balanced out how to handle it, how to deal with it. And so by 2001, I'd had an okay year, but I was still worrying about the back quite a bit. Yeah. Does that make sense? So it was not a total surprise. I love Southern Hills. I mean, yeah. I, I played a lot of my golf growing up at Colonial in Fort Worth, and there were a lot of similarities. Okay. You know, P Perry Maxwell had a lot to do with both both golf courses. And so there was always this kinship and, you know, relationship of the two clubs uh, between Colonial and, and Southern Hills. So I'd played it quite a bit as a kid growing up, you know, teenager. Uh, loved the place. Got, you know, just... It, I was playing good that week. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I remember I maybe a month or two earlier, I'd figured out a set of irons. Oh, okay. That that helped a lot. And it was exactly what we were talking about earlier today about launch. Yeah. I found some that I could actually launch in the air. And I'll even give them, they were TA5s, if you remember okay. that. Yeah, club. I do. I little, do. Little simple cavity back, yep. kind of low, low CG. And it changed my game. And I probably did that in. April maybe you know okay. after the Masters. So yeah, a couple months later then. A couple months later, and it was it was phenomenal. And I mean, I remember certain shots there. You know, like you go, and I don't remember seeing the shot, but I'm like, man, that's is because we played the Senior PGA in '19. Yeah. It, it had been redone, but not mu not much change. And there were certain par threes like we were playing from like 212, 215 back you know in 01. Sure. And I'm like, you know, I went back and I'm like, man, I, I hit the screen every day. Yeah. Like with a three iron, you know. <laughs> and uh, I couldn't anymore do that in a million years now. But it was like really interesting that little flashbacks. Right. Uh, so that's, you know, that's kind of that story. 96 is way different. I mean, I've been playing pretty much the same stuff for a long time. But I clicked onto something and I was 40 uh, at, in 2001. I was okay. born in 1961. So yeah. I was 40. And with the back and everything that gone on, I, I, if, Retief would have gone ahead and four putted 18 because he almost did. <laughs> I might not have ever played again. Yeah. Seriously. Kind of got on. I had actually on top. <laughs> yeah. It would have been drop. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> that been only only my two. wife and a couple friends knew, but you know, here we are. You know. Yeah. 22 years later, I'm not doing it anymore. But you know, 20 years later, I was still you know beating it around. But yeah, I, I was ready to. It was like you'd won the, if you'd won the PGA and that five nine you know not I'm not supremely yeah, athletic probably the the back talented thing was I'm like concerned. are you kidding I yeah. mean you know how many times do you need to climb Mount Everest you know I'd have, I'd have done it twice <laughs> yeah like, dude the third time it'll kill you right. okay and it right. kills a lot of guys trying to get back up there oh yeah even in this game mm -hmm. trust me mm -hmm. you know they either have a mic on or doing something else <laughs> so hats off to the guys that keep their you know keep their mental yeah. stability and some kind of balance and focus and can do it. I mean, Bernhard Langer, you know, I don't, he's not human. So yeah, that's how about how impressive is that? He's it's not, he's not human. He's still, how old is he now? He's, he pulled it, in the parking lot over here. I was there last night for yeah. the past champion dinner up here at Frisco and this courtesy, you know, luxury SUV pulled in and it was Bernhard. Yeah. And he was in the passenger seat. Really? Yeah. And this was not a self-drive car. So Nice. Does that give you the tent? Yeah. Bernhard, yeah. he didn't. He, he was driving this by ESP. Yeah. If you get that, it's supposed to be a joke, but it was crazy. <laughs> and he got out. He looked like he was fifty years old. Yeah. So that's he's. I mean, or forty-five. I think he's still out there every year kicking it at Augusta. He's 
you know, he made the cut just a few years ago. But so he's, he's still, he, he figured it out up here. Yeah. You know, a long time ago. Yeah. Double, triple yips, had yips several times. I know he jumped off of the subject, but man, he's a good one. He definitely had the yips. He yeah. would tell you he had the yips. Probably still has the little, little pieces of, you know, little inklings of it. But I mean, it's, He's the one they ought to cut his brain open and study it because that guy right there, I mean, it's, it's the concrete amazing. Concrete yips is not, I mean, that's probably. It's brutal. Well, yeah. Most people don't. Right. Uh, you know, once you get a certain age, like chip yips or you've seen it, I mean, they'll have to go to another method. Right. Like completely, like pot, chip, one hand. You see now guys actually going cross handed. Cross handed, chipping. for sure. I, mean, I don't know where uh, we got off on that. Ooh. But anyway. <laughs> well, let's change it then. Let's go this way. Um, for all your days on tour, do you have a favorite player to play that, with? That came from the. Yeah, yeah. Everest yeah. fall. Yeah, that's right. We were all over the yeah, place. You'll fall, you will fall. It's a fall steep. Uh, favorite player to play with in a tour event? Wow. Tiger Woods. That's easy. Yeah? Yeah, easy. Just what What was that? I mean, what was the reason for that? Just watch him Because I only got to play with Mr. Nicholas a couple of times in competition. Yeah. And even though, luckily, a little, you know, I got on tour in 84. He won the Masters in 86, famously. Oh, yeah. yep. You know, he, he was still competitive for another probably three or four or five years, but uh, I didn't get paired. He didn't play much. Okay. Uh, Tiger, because I won my major in 96. Yeah. And you're sort of in this category, and by default, you would catch Tiger some. And, of course, honestly, we took, we laughed about earlier today. Like, how many times have you played with Tiger? I said, yeah, quite a bit. I'm in, and I said, I wonder how many times I beat him. Like, zero, you know, maybe <laughs> once. Right. Single rounds you might clip him, but not, yeah. for, not for a week. But anyway, he turned pro in 96, yeah. famously at Milwaukee, you know, smashed it, whatever, 315 yards down the middle. Yeah. He made the tour championship that year. Okay. I mean, that he turned pro in the middle of July. That's right. Middle, That's late right. July. And he yep. played in the tour championship. So, uh, and I, I obviously got to play there. And that was at Southern Hills, by the way. Okay. okay. And a couple of shots, one in particular that he hit there. I still remember this day. I used to talk about it all the time. And of course, he had steel shafted, you know, little head, right, right. kind of yep, not yep, too dissimilar. Yep, 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 but right. I was whack, trying mm -hmm. to whack two, two, two ten in the in the trailer today. Excuse me, in the bay. But I got to pair with him quite a bit, and so de definitely my my that would be by far the number one. Yeah. I mean, who wouldn't want to play with it? Well, so at some the point, greatest. the the crowd's got to be huge. That you are not you're not even curious about the shot. Well, I'm oh, of course I'm curious about the fifty shot. degrees, wet, tight actually pretty dormant lie he had you gotta remember this is 1996 in november he had 274 to the hole on the fifth hole par five okay. i had hit it about 30 or whatever 30 yards behind him off the i had laid up with a four wood okay that club yeah yeah ripped it I had about 90 yards left for my third i'm walking down you know and he's waiting you know got group two guys up on the ground uh, my cat is What's he doing? Why is he waiting? Yeah. He's got the wood out, you know, got got the head cover off of this three wood. He said, man, I guess he's waiting on the green. Maybe he'll make some noise. So we got my yardage book out because I wanted to know. <laughs> and I calculated up. He had 274 to the hole. And again, it was 50 degrees. This is 1996. So a soft, a lot of golf ball. That it flew four steps behind the stick after they cleared the green. It flew 278, stopped about six feet past that. He had about a 15 footer for three. And it was like case closed. So that was that was ninety six. So the equivalent today that would have been you, a, that would have been probably a three hundred yard. Three it would be it would be similar to Justin Thomas's shot at Aaron Hills, the yeah, two hundred ninety two yard three wood that he hit in there, about five feet. Point being, and then I played with him enough, and his wedge game was oh around the greens. Uh, he's always been a magician. Mm -hmm. He just had a lot of trouble with his distance wedges. Primarily, it was launch. You yeah. know, just and it, it, there was technique issues. But he launched it too high, and fast forward, like, say, I played with him Memorial a few times. Yeah. And it, it was just kind of all over the place. I mean, he hit five iron. If it was like a nine iron through a four, two iron, when it took off, left his face, he knew within a couple steps where it was going to land. Yeah. Not true with a 90-yard wedge or a 110-yard wedge. Okay. It might come down 15 yards too far. Anyway. And then fast forward, I got paired with him somewhere in, a couple, in like 2000, and where you know, we get out, who I'm playing with, we're watching him. I mean, one of the few guys you watch, you can yeah. ask that, but, and I don't know, let's say the fourth hole, he's got this little 90 yard, and the thing came out about like that, and we yeah. both looked, I, I looked at the guys playing, I said, we're in trouble. Yeah. He's like, well, I go, this is a joke. 
Because yeah. his distance control was so tight. He figured that part out of his he game. He figured that part out, and honestly, game was over. The game was, that was his hot stretch there where he game was basically over. didn't lose for a couple years. Once he figured out how to control his distance, Dustin Johnson did a similar thing. If yeah. you, you know, if you ever really go back and watch early DJ, balls up, balls up, right. balls up. Once those wedges went like that, man, he was he got hard to beat. He yeah. got real hard to beat. Got started getting in the fairway, and his wedges got awesome. So yeah. Well, uh, let's well hold on. So that's a question I'm curious about because like you talk about tuning the trajectory, tuning stuff. When you or Tiger or anybody 20 years ago, 25 years ago, was trying to get fit or fit themselves, is it all, is it really just going to the range and hitting shots and looking at it? Is that really all it is, or was there more to it? That would depend on how much <laughs> talent you have, athletic ability, face awareness, face awareness. Yeah, yeah. Which is both launch, lo, you know, loft, de loft or loft. Right. And the, you can learn that. Uh, it's today def- you can take. You a know, I mean, you're but... a, you're a hell of a player. It's there's technique involved, mm-hmm. and my point is, so you so you're asking me, so I could go set up a barrier, okay, like with a ceiling, put a put a lid on it, yeah, and hand a kid a sixty degree sandwich or fifty six, put him just a reasonable distance behind it, and just say, don't come home until you figure out how to hit this club solidly under that wall under that ceiling, okay? When you when you get it under the ceiling and it's got some quality to it, you can come home. One kid, it might take an hour. One kid, yeah. six hours. One kid, it might take a month. Another kid might never be able to do it. So, I mean, I'm dead yeah, serious. Yeah. So, these so are the that's different... the kid you got to walk back in, and yeah. now you got to get into the explaining of the shaft lean and tag. Right. It gets pretty wild, you know, as you know. But most of the athletic kids will figure out how to get it under that right. wall. It's and, a lot then, of... and so then you go that way. So I've done this to them. Now I'm going to do this to them, okay? Yeah. And when they when the ball flies really good, you're doing it right. Yeah. You don't need to do anything else. When the ball flies really good, you're doing it right. If you can do it repeated, mm-hmm. okay? It's not a random. It can't just be one random good one because that that truly was luck. I, like I'll give you an example. I, I have all my kids, including my college or even tour guys, they're working on a shot. I, I make them hit three in a row. You can't move to the next shot till you hit three in a row duplicate, and you go. And then my saying to them is, the first one was a guess. The second one was lucky. The third one tells me you know what you're doing. Okay? Okay. And I begged them to never hit random shots. And I learned this stuff very early on. I think I got it from my team sports background, you know, even when I was young. I mean, you're in an organized practice. There was no, you know, working out and then a random shot up. I mean, are you kidding me? You know what happened then? You ran the bleachers. (laughs) <laughs> if you right. came down, decide to random chunk a three up from you know right. thirty out. No, 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 no. You're running the bleachers, or the balls are going to get put on the rack. When they said balls are about to go to the rack, you know what that meant, right? You're about to puke, man. <laughs> You're about to so run a heck of a lot. I learned that you know we messed around. I'm not saying you don't have fun, but it's like very few shots where you just randomly strike it and let it go where it goes. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean you're. Practicing with a purpose. It's not just 100. percent Yeah, that's 100%. exactly it. So, but how, you can have fun doing it. And but you know, something I see it all the time. The kids are out there, four or five of them. Everybody does it, even the adults. Oh yeah. And they're on the range, they're whacking balls, and they're talking, and they turn around, and then they just flush one. Yeah. And you go, "What'd you do there?" And he goes, oh. "I have no idea." <laughs> so anyway, yeah. it's it's pretty, it's fun. Right. Right. Um, so segue back. Tiger Woods hit very few random shots. Okay? I I can't. I imagine didn't. Bad ones, yes. Someone like him, he's laser Bad shots, focused the of whole course, time. But oh, yeah. random zero. Yeah, he's not messing around, especially if it's tournament time. I'm sure he's that pretty dialed in. Um, now, when when Dad's got the wind machine and the rain machine on you, and you're in your high chair, and you're having right. to do that just to get your food down, much less hit a golf shot, you're going to be tough. So, <laughs> oh yeah, some of those. <laughs> There's been you've seen the documentaries and yeah, the, the, pretty, the history of of how Tiger was brought up that. That'll, that'll, that's what the result is, you know. When no you, doubt. When you do that. Discipline, tough love, love, yeah. love, love. But yeah. th- but there's some discipline in there. Oh, absolutely. Um, so today, obviously now it's so, the, the equipment's different. The launch monitors are different. Um, how, I guess, is there, what's your take on how that's all progressed? It's so tech-based now, everything. Do you think there's something lost with maybe older um, traditional techniques? Well, you asked or... me, okay, I'll, I'll do it quick as I can. So you asked me earlier today, how did y'all know? Yeah. And I made a smart aleck answer, but it was true and I mean yeah. it. I used my eyes. Yeah. So I watched it fly and I got a pretty good jet. 
you've done it a million times. You can stand there and watch. You can guess pretty close. I know you can. Oh, yeah, I know. I know. With, I, with no track man there, it takes off, and you go, and you'll get within a couple hundred RPMs almost every time. You will. You'll get the, you'll get the launch, spin, you, you, you'll get the curve. So what I tell them is you can learn using the machine. I call it the machines. If you're working on a specific thing, like your pass really bad, it's yeah. a nice aid. And then go double check yourself, you know. Uh, or I'll play a game with a kid. Maybe he's not getting down. At, you know, they're not going down enough, say, with a sandwich or iron. And I'll just play the game. I'm like, all right, you're at 1.2 degrees down. Let's get it to five. Yeah. And they sort of start figuring it out. Does that make sense? Starting to know how that so it's feels. A, you go, I'm actually using the machine to become a more organic teacher. Okay. okay? Yep, I see. More, more holistic, organic style. You figure it out. Here's the goal. Here's the target. Go get it. Sure. I'm not going to go, oh, you need to lean forward. Do You figure it out. How are you going to get that club to go down down more? Yeah. You know, are you going to do it this way because that doesn't work? You can do a little, you know, they start figuring it out. And then I'll tell them when the ball flies right and the numbers are pretty good on here. Yeah. You're doing it right. Yeah. You know, that's enough. That is a little bit kind of like it's 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 how our fitters do it. Use the number the numbers too in the in the For bay. Sure. It's like they're, there's guidelines that they want to get the golfer into, and then it's kind of up to them. Say, all right, I have to change the shaft. I have to change this loft. Make this adjustment to the driver, and I have to figure it out for the player because it's not necessarily their job to fix the swing. It's make that swing work for this this equipment, and so that's their way. But that's of a fine line. Yeah. So when the pretty athletic looking person who actually is once they grip it. Walks in and they got a 15 left, you know, 12, you know, 10, 12 down, oh, yeah. 15 like left, this. eight iron, and the face is, you know, whatever, 20 degrees open, and they hit an eight iron about 80 yards. I think you're obligated to explain to that person, oh, yeah, we need well, to fix yeah, this, yeah. and y'all do it. I yeah. know you do. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, before the guy, in 10 minutes, he's hitting that eight iron instead of hitting it 115 yards, they're hitting it 160. Yeah. And then we always get the question, and then too. they're, they're, like, they're wow. wondering what these numbers mean, and it's like, well, this is because you swing way out to in. And now you're seeing that minus 12 on there. For your I'll give you my numbers I'll work pad. on, okay? The ones that, are fo- that make that really matter to me, because we're on this deal, face and path. Yeah. Face and path. That's, I mean, it, you, I preach face and path. Because you can see a draw or a fade based on those two numbers. <laughs> well, or a straight ball. Your delivery, does, you know, your delivery is going to, that's your path. Yeah. Okay, period. Once it's going in delivery, it's the path. And then you got to adjust the face. The only other thing I, I'm big on is I call it structure, and I steal from the best teachers in the world, and I've got a couple of favorites, and I steal everything I can get from them. And it's just structure, like the bony part. You got to get if you get set up pretty darn good, pretty darn good with pretty decent ball position. Then the athletic movement is learn how to load that load that structure. If yeah. you can load it, releasing it gets pretty easy. Sure, does that make sense? So yeah, I'm yeah. real I'm real big on structure. Getting mm-hmm. the person to set up decent. Yeah. And then now it gets dynamic. Now we get to, you know, play the fun games. Right. And you know, I mean you're I've watched you swing and hit tons of shots. You're just awesome at loading and unloading. And you know, if it gets out, your sequencing is out. I know you know a couple drills you can do, yeah. get right back in it. You do the nine to three, you'll do you'll step drills, you get it back like that. Uh, but that's what I do. I try to keep it organized, logical, which is hard. And, you know, use the word simple, but logical meaning if, all right, I'll back up. So this is the long one. (laughs) We weren't allowed to ask, not really even allowed to ask why. Why is in what? The word why. If your coach said, I want you to run into that wall head first. Seriously. You ran into the wall. Okay. Or you said, how hard? Or, you know, yeah. if he said, hey, guys, I want y'all to run over into the wall. And you go, well, head first or chest first. And if he gave you the choice, you you know, smart guys. Yeah, yeah, of course. Chest. My point is, we didn't ask, we didn't want to know why. You, We figured out why later. Okay, you know? Yeah. But when it comes to the golf swing, the same thing was true. If that coach said, you know, you need to do this, you didn't say, well, why, am I, why do you want me to do that? It's a little different now, you know, technology part of it, YouTube, mm-hmm. all this access to videos, thing. They want to know why. And yeah. so I've, instead of fighting them, I'm like, I try to tell them why. Okay. Okay. Why do you load here? Why do you do that? And then it might be able to stay in a cr- chronologically logical way for them to think about it. Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
so they can fix themselves. I mean, I mean, I'm, this is rambling, but it's like ultimately, if I teach them the why as much as the how, they might be able to help themselves. And that's true at all ages. Because all if you're a, a great teacher, you're teaching that person how to actually teach themselves in the long run. That's what you're trying to do. That's the ultimate yeah. goal. They don't need me anymore after right. a while. Right. I'm just there for moral support, mental health, yeah. you know, yeah. confidence building. The rest of it, they they sh they can kind of do it themselves. I mean, because we have tools now. Yeah. Just keep up with it. You know, we couldn't but see they, ourselves. They'll know how to teach themselves. You could. You're metrics. young. I couldn't. I couldn't see myself. You know, throw a club down and all that. I mean, we didn't have video. Right. So, uh, yeah. it's it's pretty interesting. Sure, but that's, sure. that's my goal. That's what yeah. I try to do. Well, so, let's kind of wrap up with, so, like, what do you, you know, the things that you're doing now in golf, because you said you're not really playing as much anymore, but... I don't play competitively at all. You've mentioned the teaching, and you've mentioned some broadcasting. So, are those things kind of keeping you busy? I think I also saw we're, maybe some course design yeah, we're a little doing, bit, too. Yeah, we're doing some course management, okay. design. Okay. Those things Time to get back into it. Well, that's, that, that's pretty much what you're between, doing right now. Between, if you said you can teach serious players, and yeah. I mean serious meaning serious about golf. Yeah, I yeah. don't mean like one handicaps. I mean, it's not like serious about getting better. Yeah, yeah. Serious enough to like give it a little effort. Yeah, yeah. Do a little homework between the two-week lessons, yeah, okay? Yeah. You know, if I said, I need you to do like a couple minutes today, man, at least do a minute, okay? You can cheat, but it's like, I don't want you to come back and you're exactly where you were. <laughs> you know, I don't want to live with you to get you better, right. okay? Um which reminds me of another great saying, but uh, and do golf course, you know, manage, you know, manage a couple of places and and golf course design. It's that's my favorite thing. Yeah, that's awesome. So I can't let you go without this. So this is it's actually it's apropos because we just finished at Oak Hill. And it was a famous story on one of the Harmons. Okay. And assistant had worked there a couple summers, and he saw Mr. Harmon going to the practice tee. And I know y'all probably heard this, but I'm going to repeat it because it's awesome. Okay. And he kept, he'd go down, it was 15 minutes. He's doing, this kid's doing hour lessons. He's making probably 20 bucks an hour. This was a long time ago. And he'd go, Mr. Harmon, go down, and 15 minutes, he's back in the shop. And he finally one day got the guts to say, Mr. Harmon, how are you able to give these lessons in like 15 minutes? And he said, he said, thought about it a minute, I'm sure he'd told it before, but he said, he said, son, when you go to the doctor, and that doctor gives you the prescription, he doesn't go home with you and watch you take the medicine. Pretty good. Made, made sense. Yeah. It's pretty good. The doc, he does not stand around watching you take the medicine. So he had gone down. He did. He saw what he needed to see in ten yep. minutes. He gave, gave the guy the, the, prescription. Gave the prescription. He's done. That's My awesome. Job is done. I'm not gonna stand out here and watch you. Awesome. So now are you doing that with yours, or are you not quite um, that level, or? I might watch him for thirty minutes. No, my, okay. my lessons last way, way longer because I I don't like doing shorties. But yeah, man, it's just awesome if you yeah. to be able to pick a swing and pick one thing. I have trouble picking one thing. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I so. suppose. But I mean, clearly a golf junkie, right? So I'm a, um, I'm a golf junkie. Yes, but Mark, uh, thank you. This whole morning, this into the afternoon now, we really appreciate your time. Um, we've got videos coming on YouTube with the club comparisons. That'll be fun. And of course, all the the barbecue today was fantastic, and I appreciate you showing me how to properly enjoy the uh, the Texas barbecue. Today.